thank you for creating such sacred space to get us started today. Thank both of you. So it's my honor to introduce our guest speaker today. That's Reverend Jackie Hawkins. I know that she's been here to this church before. We are so blessed to have her return. You know, most recently she was senior minister of Unity of the Heartland Church in Olathe, and I know that she was dearly loved there. So in addition to her ministry, Reverend Jackie has taught workshops and seminars on prosperity teachings of Charles Fillmore and Eric Butterworth, her favorites apparently, and workshops on compassion and leadership. And what I most appreciate about Jackie is, Jackie is her welcoming nature and her just incredible spiritual presence. And also when we were in ministerial school several years ago, she was one of the first students that I met. She was sort of a graduating student as I was coming in and just had this incredible ability to um, inspire and encourage. And so for that, I'm eternally grateful. So please join me in welcoming Reverend Jackie Hawkins. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me back. Um, I don't know if I said this the last time that I was here, but I have some unusually tiny ears. <laughs> and they, <laughs> and um, this may slip off, but if it does, so what? <laughs> family here, right? <laughs> and um, it is just really good to, to be back. It's so good to, to see Sean. Um, I, I believe the last time I was here, um, you announced that Sean was coming, Reverend Sean was coming. And I said, oh great, she is wonderful. So I am so uh, please that um, you welcomed me back again just to um, to be here in your presence and to share uh, what's on my heart with regards to uh, my experience with Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, I also see a couple of folks who are part of the Heartland community, and uh, it's so good to see you. I won't call out your names, but it's just so good to see you. Ah. So I'll begin this way. On a warm September Sunday evening, in 1967, a bright-eyed 17-year-old girl met face-to-face -face with her new minister. Here, this international figure who had led the 1963 March on Washington, a peaceful yet powerful call to arms for all people who believed in the inalienable rights of black Americans, of brown Americans, red Americans, yellow Americans, as well as white Americans. Here, this international figure was there to call to arms this purpose. And here a man stood who, at the age of 35, was the youngest person who had received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964. Yet, he was humble. He was approachable. He showed this young 17-year-old genuine admiration He saw her for what she was, a new congregant and a college student. 
And this college student was looking for a new church home while she was away. This, this is how I first met Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And when he extended his right hand of fellowship to me, there was an energetic spark that ran through my body. It was transformative. Every cell in my body seemed to have come alive. When that happened, on that warm Sunday evening in 1967, so now you know exactly how old I am. <laughs> At that time, I saw him for who he truly was, a warm, gentle, open person not simply this towering figure larger than life that I had seen on television, that I had read about in the newspapers and magazines. This man was approachable. He was humble. I felt the compassion coming from him. And interestingly, as a 17-year-old girl, there were two things that immediately struck me. First of all, I was struck by the fact that he was about the same height as me. I had thought, from looking at television and from reading about his amazing presence, that he was going to be at least six feet tall. But no, he wasn't. We looked each other right in the eye. So I was struck by that. The other thing that I was struck by is what I already said. And that was the sense of warmth and compassion and centeredness and integrity. I could feel it coming from him immediately. There was no pretense. And so, today I can still retrieve those feelings from that initial meeting of meeting Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. He inspired me in that very first meeting. He showed me what true leadership looks like up close. And let me tell you, it doesn't look like aggression. It doesn't look like arrogance. It doesn't look like manipulation. It doesn't look like a towering figure that says, little girl, stay in your place. No. He showed me that true greatness is compassionate. It is centered. It is sincere. It is warm and open. It is one that stands in his integrity. That is what he showed me to be true greatness. And so that initial meeting with Dr. King 
showed me so much more than what I had seen on television, so much more of, than what I had read in magazines and newspapers. It was a defining moment. And I understood him to be a person of integrity, as I said. He walked his talk. He lived his Christian principles, those that he preached. And through his example, I knew that I wanted to live like that. I wanted to live from a sense of integrity. I wanted to be open and warm and loving. But you know what? There was something else that was very familiar about Dr. King in that initial meeting. And I was trying to figure out what it was. And what it was was that I had already been in the company of a person who had those similar qualities. I had already been in the company of a person who was warm and compassionate and loving and open and who had a sense of integrity and someone who worked tirelessly on behalf of Negroes. That is what they called us back then. I had been in the company of someone exactly like that. And you know who that person was? It was Reverend E.C. Hawkins, my father. That was one of the reasons it felt so familiar to me when I met Dr. King, even though my father was over six feet tall. <laughs> My father, and I'll just say a little bit about him, he was the secretary of the local NAACP in Longview, Texas. So he was one of the leaders of the NAACP there. And he, along with his other minister friends, marched, picketed, sat in lunch counters like Woolworths, they dared to do what they were not supposed to do. And I feared for their lives because I knew that people had been killed who had done that. People who looked like my father, who looked like my mother. I was very afraid for them. And so when I met Martin Luther King, my new minister, the person who was working on behalf to change this country, to change the legal segregation laws, I was just absolutely awestruck. Because I was meeting a master orator, a master teacher, and now I knew that I was also meeting someone exactly like my father. And so here I was, this impressionable 17-year-old girl who was essentially, along with my friends, taken under the wings of this amazing human being. And so I felt that, you know, even though I'm sort of trembling in my boots, 
everything is going to be all right. Because here I'm meeting this person who truly is walking his talk. He is walking his talk. He is ensuring that folks like me and others will be judged not by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. So Dr. King was a powerful affirmation of what my father had already taught me, and that was, you cannot return hate for hate and expect to get justice. You cannot return hate for hate and expect to get justice. As Martin Luther King said in his book, Strength to Love, returning hate for hate multiplies hate. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. I heard more than a dozen sermons while I attended Ebenezer Baptist Church my freshman and sophomore years at Spelman College in Atlanta. And a number of those times, I heard Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King speak on Sundays when he wasn't traveling around the country to do what he felt it was his to do as a leader of the civil rights movement. And let me tell you, when I heard him on Sunday mornings, just as when others in the congregation heard him, it was electrifying. And while he may have used notes sometimes in his messages, he had such a command of his material that you were mesmerized in your seats, mesmerized. And he left everything right there. He left nothing unsaid when he was speaking. And he and Daddy King, his father, the senior minister at Ebenezer, let us all know that the civil rights movement of the 60s was more than that. It was a spiritual movement. And the way that we were going to win our freedom, that we must come from our hearts. There was a foundation of love Martin Luther King was so, while he was a great orator, in terms of his personality, his true core personality, he was so much like his mother. She was a gentle woman. Daddy King was quite fiery. <laughs> but Martin Luther King truly in terms of personality, was a gentleman. I also had the opportunity to know a little bit more about Martin Luther King because his sister was one of my instructors at Spelman College when I was a freshman, when I was an incoming freshman. And she, again, had a similar personality to their mother. And so as we see Dr. King, as you see Dr. King in his fiery speeches, that is not all of what the man was. His core was very gentle. His core was very warm and loving. But unfortunately, as you know, on April 4th, 
1968, my in person physical knowing of Dr. King came to an end when he was shot and killed in Memphis, Tennessee. That evening, I was in my dormitory room studying, and one of my friends, one of my dorm mates, came running down the hallway, and the dorm was Morehouse North, came running down the hallway, banging on my door, but she was also a member of Ebenezer, and in fact, she, at home in Birmingham, was a member of Martin Luther King's brother's church, A.D. So Alma comes running down the hall, knocking on the door, hysterical, saying, Jackie, Jackie, they shot him, they shot him, they killed him. I said, what are you talking about, Alma? They killed Dr. King. They killed Dr. King. Now, I didn't believe Alma because Alma was kind of excitable. You know how, you know? I loved Alma. But she was kind of excitable. So it's like, Alma, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. I said, calm down, Alma. But not even a minute later, our house mother called all of us in the dormitory downstairs to the lounge on the first floor. And she gave us all the news that indeed Dr. King had been killed. We were all hysterical. There was a, an immediate lockdown of all of the students on Spelman's campus, not just our dormitory, because they feared that there would be violence. As you know, Atlanta was his home. And indeed, there was violence all across the city. We were allowed to use the phones. There were pay phones, one pay phone on each floor, and there were three floors of the dormitory. So we had to wait in line to use the phone to call home so that our parents would know that we were okay. I was able to call my father. Finally, I reached him, let him know that I was okay. And then over the next few days, Martin Luther King was finally brought home. And the last time I saw his body was in a coffin on Spellman's campus in Sisters Chapel. There was a sea of people, a sea of people who came to pay their respects to Martin Luther King. People from all over the world, celebrities, dignitaries, ministers of all different religions from the world over. And my father flew in from Lansing, Michigan to pay his respects as well as to see me. Martin Luther King <clears throat> said, love is the most durable power in the universe, in the world. This creative force is the most potent instrument available in mankind's quest for peace and security. And regardless of the tragic death that he met, he continued, and his father, and his mother, and his sister and brother, his wife, they all continued to preach, to speak, to live from love. Because love cannot, hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So it was not, in 
in our interests to hate. It has never been in any of our interest to hate. And I am so, so grateful for seeing Martin Luther King live what he preached. Live love. There is a, is a refrain from one of his um, favorite songs. And that refrain is, my living shall not be in vain. And this refrain is from a song that's all about love and service. And it's a song that I, that I learned when I was a little girl growing up in, in the church that my father pastored in Longview, Texas. And the name of that song is, If I Can Help Somebody. And maybe some of you know that song. But this morning, what I would like for us to do is to um, perform that song together as a rap. <laughs> All right? Are you with me? Okay, I, I will lead, and then you can kind of get the flow of the rap, okay? All right. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or a song, if I can show somebody that they're traveling wrong, then my living shall not be in vain. Let's do that again. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or a song, if I can show somebody that they're traveling wrong, then my living shall not be in vain. My living shall not be in vain then my living shall not be in vain. If I can help somebody as I pass along, then my living shall not be in vain. If uh, I knew I was going to... There it is. If I can do my duty as a person ought, if I can bring back beauty to a world of raw, if I can spread love's message as the master taught, then my living shall not be in vain. Let's say that again. If I can do my duty as a person ought, if I can bring back beauty to a world of raw, if I can spread love's message as the master taught, then my living shall not be in vain. Yeah! Martin Luther King taught me and countless others to not allow our living to be in vain, meaning that let's live beyond ourselves but begin from the love that is within each and every one of us. That is what I know about Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Yes, I met him a number of times. That initial meeting was powerful, and I will always remember that. But most importantly, I will remember him as a person of great love and strength and courage and perseverance and knowing that we can all live together as brothers and sisters when we come from that knowing, that deep knowing of the love that we are. That is how our laws were changed in this country, so that people who look like me could have the same equal rights as people who look like most of you. But guess what? Those laws are in jeopardy now. 
and we must live from the love that we know. I mean, we know that in unity, right? right. So let's live that. Let's ensure that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is not overturned. Let's ensure that the Voting Rights Act of 1965 is not totally demolished. Let's ensure that the Fair Housing Act of 1968 is not destroyed. We can do that through the love that we know. So that is what I know about Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Thank you. This, this next song is uh, a little mini sampling of what Hannah and I do traveling around the world and especially between Kansas City and Texas a lot in a loop um, with sound meditation, sound bath, and assisting with those, those things that block us from love and how to use the power of the mind to crack that open and move into that presence that we truly are. So I invite you to receive. Open yourself as every bit as best you can and relax into these sounds. And I'll be curious to see what you observe. <laughs> 